church. I think it's officially full now. Uh, I got a, I got the trifecta in this week. I had some hot coffee on a cool, brisk morning. I had some uh, pumpkin spice something or other. And then uh, last night I capped it off with the old apple cider. So I think we're there. Uh, but it's a blessing to be here with you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, would you go to Lord in prayer with me as we enter into his word? Father God, um, continue to be so grateful, Lord, um, for the word that you've given us. It's an encouragement. It's a reminder, Lord, of the hope that we have. It's a challenge. It convicts us. It pushes us to more. And uh, thankful, Lord, that you are a God who uh, loves us as we are, but you desire, Lord, so much more for us. You desire, Lord, that we continue to grow and be shaped in the image of your Son. So, Lord, would you just uh, continue to mold us and shape us, uh, be with us in this study through the book of Romans, Lord, that you would uh, just uh, meet us right where each one of us are. Uh, I'm sure many of us came in this week, uh, came in this morning feeling tired and burdened from the week that we've had. Uh, I'm sure others came in this morning, Lord, just joyful for what you've done, the beauty all around us, the the blessings of friends and family, a a solid job, uh, whatever it is, Lord, that we're coming in with this morning. We, we pray that you would remind us, Lord, of our dependence on you. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us that it is you who saves. It is you, Lord, um, who gives all good things to us. And so, Lord, help us to live lives of gratitude and, and radical response to what you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you were to ask a passerby on the street, what is a Christian? In downtown Denver... My guess is that you'd probably hear quite a range of responses. The more thoughtful among them might suggest something like someone who follows the teachings of Jesus or someone who goes to a Christian church. And that's probably a a pretty hopeful thought on my part. I'm confident that that most of the responses we'd get would be with a more negative tone. The same thoughts seem to be held of Jewish Christians living in first century Rome. They did not seem to be known as tender-hearted Christ followers as much as they were known as rigid, rule-following and rule-enforcing followers of the law. The two most important and distinguishing marks of being uh, Jewish at that time were uh, were to possess the possession of two things, the law and the covenant sign of circumcision. For centuries, this had been the case. There was a pride built up in that a certainty of their standing before God. For them, it seemed to be a license to look down on those who did not carry these same marks of the faith. In today's text, Paul is going to discuss the value of these two marks of the faith, the law and circumcision. And and what he's going to do is to question their value. So understand, as we read the text today, that Paul then naturally is making statements about the value of being Jewish. Recall what Paul has already said in chapter 2. The Jewish Christians, because they do the same things, verse 1, as everyone else, so like everyone else, they are also subject to God's wrath. Well, Paul doesn't dismiss the privileges of being one of God's chosen people. Chapter 3, we'll get into that even more. Paul's very clear on one thing. The blessings that God gave his people, Israel, did not in themselves bring rescue from judgment. Those blessings need to be responded to. It's like the blessings God gives us today need to be responded to. Think of it this way. God has blessed us with wonderful gifts. He has provided me with so many things to bless me. Provided for my needs. Physical, emotional, relational. Beyond this, he speaks to us. I have a ton of translations of, God's, of, of, of the Bible, God's very word for us. I can hold it in my hand. I can be confident of God's truth. I still have to respond to it. I still have to do something with it. To possess something does not mean that you get the benefit of it. Or think of it this way. Let's say you're given an amazing gift, a sports car or a, an amazing jacuzzi. That's what we call them back in Minnesota. It's the, we call it a jacuzzi. Um, <laughs> To get the benefit of it, you actually have to get in it. You actually have to use it, right? Your your sports car might look really great in the garage, but until you actually leave the garage in it, 
It doesn't do you any good. In the same way, if, if the hot tub is just there bubbling away, you get none of the benefits unless you actually use it, until you actually do something with it. God's desire always, from the beginning with his people, was to be with them. If you ever wonder what God desires, what he wants, the image he has, what what he would desire, think of the garden. The garden is what he created and desired before sin ever entered the picture. That's what God desires. Closeness, dependence, love, conversation, a heart that admires him to know and to be known. The garden relationship is God, what God wants with you again. We are the ones that have wanted things from God. We want what we can get. The benefits without the obedience. The gifts without the sunk cost of time. The forgiveness without the surrender. The Savior in his salvation without the Lord in his kingship. The law and circumcision were signs of being an Israelite. They were meant to be blessings, meant to be a gift, not of restriction, but of remembrance, not of limitation, but of guidance. But those blessings needed to be responded to with obedience. As we read this first section, while it's it's not a, a perfect substitute, it may be helpful for you to consider substituting the word Christian for Jew in the first line. Romans 2, verses 17 to 24. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In the previous passage, Paul didn't explicitly mention who his target was. He just said in verse 1, you have no excuse. But now he brings that out in the open. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, that's who this is directed at. The religious, the pious, the seemingly righteous. If that is you, Paul then launches into a series of if claims. He tells of the many privileges enjoyed by Israel. If you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior, if you are a guide for the blind, a light for those in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, all of these privileges that Paul mentions are legitimate. Every one of them is explicitly mentioned somewhere in the Old Testament. There's roots and foundations for each of these. So the problem is not that Israel is boasting in what is not really theirs. The problem is that they're not living up to their claim. That's the problem. Consider that for us. We need to consider that for ourselves. There are many privileges. There are many blessings. There are many things we ought to be. Are we living up to the claim? So let's look at these nine privileges. They're Jews, descendant of Judah. The name signifies that they belong to that people, the ones God chose to be his own. This is the fundamental privilege. Everything else was true because they were God's chosen people, a people called to be a blessing. Number two, they rely on the law. They were proud of the fact that they were entrusted with the law of God. Paul makes the same point as the prophet Micah had made six centuries earlier After rebuking the people for their sin, the the prophet said, Micah 3.11, Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. We have the law. We're gods. We have nothing to fear. They boast, number three, they boast about their relationship with God. The Greek word for boasting is is, uh, kachomai. And it does not have any negative connotations. You and I hear the word boast and we immediately think, oh, that's obviously a bad thing. There's nothing negative about the thought of boasting in God. It's a sin to boast in yourself, but it's not a sin to boast in God. God had established 
a relationship with them, and they were right in celebrating that fact. Number four, they know God's will. By way of God's own word and their judges and leaders and prophets, God had made his will known to Israel. Number five, they approve of what is superior. They can distinguish what is really important, what really matters. This goes beyond just knowing good versus evil, but from understand, about understanding what God has emphasized and given priority to. They know what matters most. The last four take more of a turn and involve the Jewish sense of being superior to other people. It's a twist on, on what is true. Six and seven, they are a guide for the blind and a light for those who are in the dark. These are two ways of saying sort of the same thing. As a people, privy to the ways of God, they were meant to be a blessing to others. But not just a kind of pat you on the head, send you on your way kind of a blessing. They were meant to be a people who spoke truth and, and spoke compassionately to people, leading them to the Lord. They were meant to be instruments of God's salvation to the world. Consider Isaiah 42 uses some of this same language. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Jesus would later add a, a twist to their claim, their call to be guides, calling the Pharisees blind guides in Matthew 15, 14. The Jews were to be the religious instructors of the world according to God's own appointment, but they obviously fell short. Eight and nine, they are instructors of the foolish and teachers of infants. They were to share true knowledge of God with people who did not know, what God, did not know God. Their own literature reflected this understanding. In those days, he says, the Lord will be patient and cause the children of the earth to hear. Reveal it to them with your wisdom, for you are their guides. And the people of the great God will again be strong, who will be guides in life for all mortals. They were to be guides, helpful guides. I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure many of you have gone more on more guided tours than I have. What a blessing it is to have a guide leading you through a place you've never been, leading you through, through something, showing you amazing things on the way. That is, to who, that is who Israel was to be. There's nothing more helpful, nothing more of a gift than a guide in a foreign place. But they were not that. This was their privilege. This was their purpose. But this is not who they were. These statements end here. In the NIV, it's marked with a dashed line. You... If this is true of you, if this is who you are called to be, if you are God's chosen people, if you are meant to be, a, to be hope, a blessing, a guide for the blind, then what have you done? You were supposed to be God's instrument. You were supposed to be satisfied and find your full acceptance in God's loving kindness. You were supposed to put your confidence in the Lord. You're supposed to amplify God and his goodness as your purpose. You had everything. You were equipped with every tool you might need. God was with you. God was for you. He blessed you abundantly. But you're not even any better than those around you. People who've never heard of God. You're not like Jesus. In fact, things are so bad, verse 24, that God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. A reference back to Isaiah 52 and Ezekiel 36. Paul's saying this. There are privileges for Israel. They're definite. He can name them. But because they have not used them rightly, used them compassionately, used them for others, they've dishonored God. We today have many privileges. We are free to worship God, learn about him, hold his word in our hands, speak to him freely and at any time that we want. As free to do these things as anyone has ever been. We, among all people, are without excuse. We've been planted in rich soil. We get every nutrient we could possibly need. We receive fresh rains and consistent sunshine. We ought to bear fruit. The Jews in Rome instead were weaponizing their faith. 
Or you could say using it as sort of a step, a step stool to elevate themselves. We do the same things today when we read Scripture to amplify our own knowledge, but not to embody the things that we learn. We do the same things when we use it to accuse others, but never to examine our own hearts. Martin Lloyd-Jones has this quote that's been rattling around in my mind the last few years. As you read your Bible day by day, do you apply the truth to yourself? What is your motive when you read the Bible? Is it just to have a knowledge of it so you can show others how much you know and argue with them? Or are you applying the truth to yourself? As you read, say to yourself, this is me. What is it saying about me? Allow the scripture to search you, otherwise it can be very dangerous. There is a sense in which the more you know of it, the more dangerous it is to you if you do not apply it to yourself. We must apply the truth to ourselves and be humbled by it. We must be very careful that we are not talking about things theoretically without troubling about the application of them to our personal lives. People are judging Christ by you and by me. They say, look at those Christians. They can talk marvelously when the sun is shining, when the business is going well, and when there's no trouble in the family. But the moment anything goes wrong, they do not seem to have anything. They are even worse than many who are not Christians. Is that Christianity? How terrible a thing. I'm horrified at the thought that because of my living, my speech, my conduct, my love or lack thereof, anyone could think less of God because of me. We ought to examine our hearts. This is a terrible example. I wasn't going to share this, but it just popped in my head. Um, I'm great with people putting the fish on their car. Let me tell you why I don't have a fish on the back of my car. (laughs) I don't have a fish on the back of my car because I don't want people to know I'm a Christian by how I drive. And I think I'm a fine driver. I want people to know I'm a Christian because of how I love. Because how I listen to them. Because how I care. I want people to know I'm a Christian because I interact with them. We need to care about how we represent. I remember one of the first uh, little talks, I, one of the first weeks I was here, I had a little talk about how I, I used to work for Pepsi, and I, I didn't have all my Pepsi stuff with me, but uh, usually I've, I've done this presentation with kids before where I'll have a, my Pepsi uniform on and my Pepsi hat and my Pepsi pants, all this stuff. I didn't have Pepsi shoes, but everything else. Everything. I had Pepsi clubs, everything. And, I, and, I, and I, I come up in all my Pepsi gear and I, I open up a can of Coca-Cola and I drink it in front of them. Because you feel something. You feel something. You have to feel something. And I, told, I tell them how when I worked at Pepsi, I, I was told there was a Coca-Cola man who was fired for drinking a Pepsi on the job. Fired for it. And we were given literature. If you go and buy Coca-Cola down at the gro- local grocery store, you will be fired. kind of crazy but what are we wearing what are we wearing you may not have a fish you may not have a cross on your necklace what are you wearing and what are we doing as we wear those clothes what are we doing as we represent Jesus Christ not just Sunday morning but every day of the week this is what Paul's speaking into you're looking good you've got the right branding yeah, you've got the circumcision piece. You've got the, you've got the law. How, how are you looking like Christ again? This is, this is what sin is. This, is. this is how the world understands Christians when we're partaking in the, the, in the Coca-Cola of the world, okay? I'm a Pepsi man. I can't help it. I love Pepsi. So, how terrible a thing. How terrible a thing. Paul keeps going. He's talked quite a bit up to this point about them possessing the law. Now he shifts to this, um, this other privilege, this privilege of circumcision. Romans 2, 25-29. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. It has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you've become as though you've one who had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though, as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. 
No, a person who is a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Next to the law, circumcision was the most important distinguishing mark of Judaism. Paul doesn't deny that circumcision circumcision has value, but its value is contingent on one thing, obedience. Our branding is a value if we use it, if we resemble the thing which we're saying we are. An outward sign could signify that you belong to physical Israel, but only what is inward, what our heart declares about us, what we embody, where our hope lies, our deepest held beliefs, that is what signifies whose we are. What does Paul mean by observing the law? That's how he begins the section. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. To understand that, we need to understand what circumcision meant to the people of God. And this is where Keller really comes through for us. Because I've always understood circumcision to be kind of merely this sign of this new covenant with God. But Keller explains, it's a visual sign of the penalty for breaking covenant. In ancient times, you didn't sign your name to bind a deal. You acted out the curse that you would accept if you broke covenant. So a man might pick up some sand and drop it on his head to say, if I break the promises I've made on this day, may I become like this dust. Or he may cut an animal in half and walk between the pieces to say, if I disobey this covenant, may I die as this animal has. This is what God did in sealing his covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15. You guys wouldn't believe how much this concept is used in Scripture. The books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy are based almost entirely on this way of thinking. If the people of God broke from their disobedience, they were made known what it would cost them. So what Paul is saying, catching back up to Romans 2, is that circumcision is this act is this visual sign of acting out what would happen if you turn away from God. You will be, in every sense, cut off from God. It is a reminder of what God has committed to us and what we have committed to God. As soon as circumcision or any other outward act, church attendance, Bible reading, service, good deeds, anything, As soon as that becomes what we rely on, we have forfeited the only thing we can truly depend on. A true circumcision of the heart, the perfectly sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For application today, how can we possibly be right with God? On the one hand, I feel like this chapter has absolutely dismantled a reliance on any external thing. And that's a good thing. Religiosity, moralism, legalism must be dismantled. The Jewish Christians to whom Paul was writing were dependent upon their special position as God's chosen people and the law and circumcision to not only show that they were right with God, but superior to others. That's wrong and that needed to be corrected. But the other thing that this chapter has done is to show that no one keeps the law. No one can do it. That sign of circumcision to show you will be cut off if you've disobeyed. We've all disobeyed. It seems too late. No one even comes close. No one does good. How do we walk away from this message with hope? What can give us confidence that we won't be cut off like all those who disobey, who want to be guides for other people, but really we're blind too? Here's what gives me confidence. How can we have hope? Because the cutting off has already happened. That cutting off already happened. For you, in your place. Paul would write to the church in Colossae, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. It's not good enough. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. 
Isaiah 53, 8 tells us that in his death, Christ was cut off from the land of the living for you. Our works, our acts, our outward circumcisions are no good because we are lawbreakers. We need what Christ has done. If you need some hope today for yourself, for that friend or family member who's still a far way off, know that Jesus saves. Know that anyone, anyone who comes to God for forgiveness is met with his amazing grace. Let me close with these words out of Isaiah. Let them fall on you. Let no foreigner who's bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Let no eunuch, someone who had been cut off, complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths. That sounds like law to me. That sounds a little scary. It sounds like whoever does the right things. But listen to these next two lines. Who choose what pleases me. To those who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. Those who grasp with everything they have, not unto some external thing, not unto something they have done, but to his covenant that he makes with us. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever, literally that will never be cut off. Let's pray. Father God, um, I'm so thankful that just to be met with the truth that there is nothing I can do. There is nothing I can do to earn your favor, to be good enough, Lord. Um, We ask, Lord, that this morning that, that you would help us Uh, in this process of sanctification, in this process of being made more in your image, that you would help us, Lord, to see the the effect that we have on the world. What is being said of you because of us? What is being done about you because of us? Help help us, Lord, to remember um, on days when we're wearing a cross around our neck and on days when we're not, that we represent you. We can't shut that off. We can't turn that off, not for a minute. We can't take a vacation from it. We represent you everywhere. Would you help us, Lord, to see that that is not a burden? It's our purpose. It's everything I have. Any, any good thing I could ever do in this life comes from the fact that you have saved me and I now represent you with everyone I come across. If we see that as a burden, we will suffer. If we see that as some chain around us, if we see that as shackles on our feet, we will suffer, we will curse your name. Who could ever live up to that? If we see it as our calling, if we see it as, Lord, the thing that you, have, you desire to reach the world through, this was your plan from the beginning, Lord. You came, you saved, and you worked through people. Fishermen and tax collectors. Some of the worst of the bunch, you pick them, Lord. And you pick us. That we might be instruments of your kindness. That we might be people who, when the world sees us, the world goes, who is that God? He seems amazing. He seems to be loving. Might people see that in us? Not judgment, not condemnation, not hatred, not not condescension. Lord, the people would see love in us. Because we have been loved. The people would be met with forgiveness when they wrong us. Because we were met with forgiveness when we wronged you. Lord, would you convict us? Would you challenge us? Don't let us rely on anything but you. Help us to know that you will meet us in our need. Help us to know, Lord, that you will provide what we need to have faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen.